Hello, third grade, and welcome to Unit 6, Week 4. We're going to begin with our vocabulary words. The first word is the word inhabited. A place that is inhabited is lived in. That means people or animals or plants, something lives there, so it is inhabited. Next, we have the word unaware. If you are unaware of something, that means you didn't notice it or you don't know it. So unaware has the prefix un, which means not. So when you're not aware of something, you don't know that it's there. So an example sentence is the predator attacks the unaware prey, right? The animal that's being hunted or the thing that's being hunted doesn't know that the predator is there. Next, we have the word illegal. Something that is illegal is not lawful. It's against the law. So the prefix il means not. So illegal means something that is not legal. Next, we have the word endangered. Endangered is a word that we use to describe an animal or a thing that is close to being extinct or gone forever. So when it's endangered, that means it is in danger of becoming extinct or being gone forever. The next we, word we have is the word fascinating. So if something is fascinating, that means it's extremely or very interesting. Our next word is the word respected. If something is respected, that means it's being honored or admired, uh, it's being taken care of. Our next word is the word requirements. Requirements are the things that you need, the things that you require for whatever it is. You can have requirements to survive, like you need food and water and shelter. You can have requirements for doing a painting project, like those requirements would be paint and paint brushes and paper or canvas to paint on. And our last word is the world word wildlife. Wildlife is basically the plants and animals that you have in their natural habitat. So if you go out to a forest, uh, the wildlife there is the plants and animals that are already living there on their own. They weren't brought in there. Our spelling words for this week are going to focus on our controlled vowel syllables. Now we've done a lot of these in the past. We have a few more of them today. Remember, anytime uh, letter R comes after a vowel, it's called an R controlled vowel or an R controlled vowel syllable. And we call this the bossy R because it makes a strong R sound. So some of the R controlled vowels uh, that we have are either EI, ER, IR, or UR. We also have AR and OR, but for those, for the words that we have today, these are the ones we're going to focus on. So we have the words severe, prepared, declare, later, writer, seller, trailer, author, person, circus, garlic, partner, restore, sister, actor, explained, brief, enjoys, circular, and editor. For our notes for this week for uh, grammar and ELA, we're going to start talking about or reviewing some of our suffixes. So we're going to focus on Latin suffixes. Remember, a suffix is a word part that is attached or stuck onto the end of a word. And it, its job is to modify or change the meaning of that word. So we have the suffix ment, M-E-N-T, which means the state, uh, action, or the result of something. So an establishment is the state of being established. Uh, enjoyment is when you are enjoying something. An argument is the action of, you know, the actions or the word exchange when you are arguing with someone or disagreeing with someone. Entertainment is the result of being entertained. And then we have able and able. So that means capable of doing something or something that can be done or the state of being. Now, there's a rule for when you use A-B-L-E and when you use I-B-L-E, even though they have the same meaning. Able with an A uh, is used when, uh, when the word that you're working with is already a complete standalone word. 
So you're adding it to a whole word. You're not adding it to a word part. So preventable, the word prevent is a whole word. Adaptable, the word adapt is already a whole word by itself. Predictable, acceptable, predict and accept are already words on their own. We add able to a root word that is not a complete word. So if I tell you something is edible, ed by itself is not a whole word. Something that is convincible, uh, convince, like when it's spelled C-O-N-V-I-N-C by itself is not a whole word. Divisible, divis is not a word. Horrible, for it is not a whole word. H-O-R-R-I. Or permissible, permiss is not a whole word. So you use able when you're adding it to a word that's already a standalone word or a whole word by itself. You use I-B-L-E when you're adding it to a word part that doesn't work by itself. Now, an adverb is a word that, is, that tells us more about our action verb. And it almost always answers the question how, when or how often, and where. So when we have words like slowly, loudly, carefully, quickly, quietly, sadly, these are all adverbs. They're describing the way something is being done. Now, adverbs, most of the time, but not always, will tell how. And those are usually the ones that end with L-Y. Now, we add the comparative ending E-R when we're comparing two things or two actions in this case. And we add E-S-T when we're comparing three actions or three things. So I can say he's louder or he can sing louder that I can than I can. So we added that ER ending to that verb because we're describing that he can do it louder or more than I can. We're comparing just the two things. This book is bigger than the last one. I can run faster than my sister. And we use the superlative ending, the EST, when we're comparing more than two things or three or more things. Uh, quiet becomes quietest, bright becomes brightest, strong becomes strongest. Now, when we're comparing, we can also use more and most. We can use well, better, or best, or we can use badly, worse, or worst. So we talked about comparative and superlative endings multiple times already in the past. So our basic comparative and superlative endings are the ER and the EST. But when we're talking about um, words that have more than two syllables, usually we add the word more or most before that word instead of adding the ER or the EST. We don't use both. You either use ER or EST or you use the word more or most before the verb. So longer adverbs that are more difficult to say with ER or EST because they have multiple syllables, right? We use more or most before them instead because it's easier to say. So I don't say uh, easier or easiliest, right? That's difficult to say, that's a mouthful. I can say something is more easily or this was uh, done most easily, more patiently or most patiently. Now, when we're using the adverb well, we use well when, de when we're describing verbs. We don't use good. Good is used for describing nouns. We talked about that in the past. We use well when we're describing an action. So well is our, our word. The comparative form of well is better and the superlative form of well is best. So well for one thing, better for talking about two things and best for talking about three things. So. We use well when we're describing one verb. I don't feel well today, right? You're talking about the way you feel. You use better to compare two verbs. I am better at hiding than my little sister. So I'm comparing the way I hide to the way my little sister hides. Or I use best when I'm comparing three or more verbs. That's a superlative form. She is the best runner on our team. Now, same thing for bad, worse, and worst. So bad, or sorry, badly is when we're talking about one verb. Worse is when we're talking about two verbs. And worst, with a P at the end, is when we're talking about three or more verbs. 
So the warehouse has been badly damaged by the fire. So we're talking about the damage that it got. My headache feels worse today than it did yesterday. I'm comparing how it felt on those two days. Or my project looked worst of all after I forgot it outside in the rain. So I'm comparing it to all the other projects. Now, as a reminder, again, you cannot use more and most and ER and EST at the same time. You pick one or the other. When you're, when you're using short words, you can add the ER or EST. When you're using longer words, you're going to add more and most before the word. Now, again, we're going to review good and well. So remember, good, we said, is an adjective that's used to describe or modify a noun, but well is an adverb that's used to describe or modify a verb. So if I tell you to please use good handwriting, handwriting is a thing. This pie is so good, right? I'm describing the pie, it's a noun. This drawing is very good. Good is describing the drawing. It's a thing, it's a noun. Now, we said well is an adverb. It's used to describe verbs that tell how. She built her sand castle well. So we're talking about how she built it. That's an action, the thing you do. Do you feel well? He draws very well. Drawing is an action. So good is an adjective that is related to a noun. Well is an adverb that's related to a verb. Let's go ahead and jump into our readings. Our first story that we're going to read is an expository text. That means it's going to give us information. And it is called Alligators and Crocodiles. Genre, expository text. Alligators and Crocodiles. Essential question. How can learning about animals help you respect them? Read about two amazing reptiles. Find out why we should respect them. By Gail Gibbons Something glides slowly through the water, barely making a ripple. It is well hidden and looks like a bumpy drifting log. Two eyes and a snout appear above the water. It is an alligator or a crocodile. Alligators and crocodiles are members of a group of reptiles called crocodilians. croc a dil e ends They are the closest living relatives of dinosaurs and the world's largest reptiles. Alligator. Crocodile. All reptiles are cold-blooded animals. In order to survive, they must keep their body temperature from getting too hot or too cold. They do this by moving to a cooler or warmer place. According to paleontologists, paleontologists, alligators, crocodiles, and dinosaurs lived on Earth about 230 million years ago. About 65 million years ago, dinosaurs became extinct, but alligators and crocodiles continued to live. Paleontologists are scientists who learn about ancient life by studying fossils, the remains of a plant or animal that lived at least 10,000 years ago. Extinct means no longer in existence. The word crocodile comes from the word crocodilos, crocodilos, which means lizard in Greek. The word alligator comes from elegarto, elegarto, which means the lizard in Spanish. There are two different kinds of alligators and 14 different kinds of crocodiles. The only area inhabited by both alligators and crocodiles is the southern tip of Florida and the Florida Keys, where alligators and crocodiles live. Red, alligators. Orange, crocodiles. North America, Atlantic Ocean. Equator, 
South America, Pacific Ocean, Africa, Europe, Indian Ocean, Asia, Australia. Alligators and crocodiles usually live in climates where the water and air temperatures are warm all year long. Some alligators live in cooler climates, where they must hibernate if it gets too cold. Where American alligators and crocodiles live in the United States. Red, alligators. Blue, alligators and crocodiles. Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Gulf of Mexico, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina. South Carolina, Atlantic Ocean, Florida, Florida Keys. Hibernate means to rest and sleep during the winter. Stop and check. Reread. Where do crocodiles and alligators live together? Reread page 526 to find the answer. The differences between an American alligator, the head, back, and tail, are dark gray or black, wide rounded snout, wide head, sensory pits on head only, thick, skin covered bony plates, ear slits, back, long, strong tail, leg, four webbed toes on each back foot, knee, stomach, nostrils, eye, mouth, neck, tongue, five webbed toes on each front foot. An American alligator's mouth and teeth. Teeth. Only top teeth can be seen when jaws are closed. Long, strong tail. Strong jaws. And an American crocodile. The head, back, and tail are tan or greenish-gray. Sensory pits all over body. Narrow head. Narrow long snout. Thick, skin-covered bony plates. Back. Ear slits. Nostrils. Leg. Four webbed toes on each back foot. Knee. Stomach. Five webbed toes on each front foot. Neck. Eye. Mouth. Tongue. An American crocodile's mouth and teeth. Teeth. Upper and lower teeth can be seen when jaws are closed. Strong jaws. Alligators and crocodiles are carnivores. To catch their prey, they may stay perfectly still. When an animal comes near, snap! The animal is grabbed in a split second. Alligators and crocodiles may also swim slowly and quietly to their unaware prey and attack. Carnivores are animals that eat meat. Alligators and crocodiles each have about 60 pointed teeth. When they lose a tooth, a new tooth takes its place. They can grow about 3,000 new teeth during their lives. Young alligators and crocodiles usually feed on small prey, such as fish, frogs, and birds, using their powerful jaws and sharp teeth. Larger, older alligators and crocodiles may eat big animals, such as raccoons and deer. Often they grab their prey and hold its nose underwater until the animal drowns. Also, they may leap to catch their prey. They eat by ripping the animal apart and swallowing the pieces whole. Cold-blooded animals do not eat as often as warm-blooded animals. Stop and check. Reread. What do alligators and crocodiles eat? Reread to find the answer. Alligators and crocodiles live in the water. Alligators and crocodiles are good swimmers and spend most of their time in the water. 
They use their powerful swishing tails to move forward. They are able to steer using their tails and back legs. By tucking in all four legs, they are able to swim faster. They can swim up to six miles, 9.6 kilometers an hour. They can stay underwater for as long as two hours. And on the land. They can crawl, walk, and run. Sometimes they walk with their bodies high off the ground. This is called the high walk. Crawl, walk, run, high walk. Alligators and crocodiles are nocturnal. They see well in the dark. They also see far away very well. They cannot see well underwater. Crocodiles and alligators have excellent senses of smell. They also have excellent senses of hearing. They are able to pick up vibrations in the air or water using their ears as well as the shallow nerves on top of their heads. Sensory pits on their bodies also help detect vibrations in the water. Vibrations alert them to any nearby prey. The thick, bony plates of American alligators and American crocodiles help protect them. Nocturnal means being active at night. The shallow nerves are under the skin on top of their heads. Each ear is hidden behind a slit in the skin. Alligators and crocodiles can make roaring, grumbling, and hissing sounds. When they are protecting their territory, they will puff out their necks to show that they are ready to fight. During mating season, males and females communicate by making grunts, barks, and low rumbling sounds. Often they rub snouts, blow bubbles on the water surface, and swim together in circles. Sometimes they will make sounds by slapping the surface of the water to attract a mate. A few weeks later, the females lay their eggs in nests, where the eggs will be kept warm and protected. Mother alligators and crocodiles are always on the alert, guarding their nests to protect their young from any egg eating animals, such as skunks and raccoons. An American alligator's nest. The female lays about 45 eggs on a bed of leaves and grasses. She then completely covers them with a mound made of leaves, grasses, and mud. The mound is about six feet, 1.8 meters wide. Mound. Nest. Eggs. A group of eggs is called a clutch. An American crocodile's nest. The female digs a hole in the ground and lays about 50 eggs. She covers each layer and the top with sand. Nest. Eggs. Usually it takes about 65 days before the alligator and crocodile eggs begin to hatch. Newborns are called hatchlings. Most hatchlings are about 10 inches, 25.4 centimeters long. Within minutes of hatching, their mother takes them to the water. The warmth of the inside of the nest helps determine. Whether the newborns will be males or females. When the temperature of the nest is above 88 degrees Fahrenheit, 31 degrees Celsius, most of the hatchlings will be males. When the temperature is lower, most will be females. The mother can hear her young making squeaking sounds from inside the eggs. They are ready to hatch. A baby may use its egg tooth. To crack open the hard shell and break free. Sometimes the mother uses her tongue to roll an egg against the roof of her mouth. Soon the shell cracks open and the hatchling crawls out. American alligator. American alligator hatchling. The female alligator and crocodile stay close to their young for about a year. 
they protect them from harm before the young ones go off on their own. Young alligators and crocodiles grow about one foot, 0.3 meter, a year for their first six years. As they get older, they grow slower. They continue to grow throughout their lives. Alligators and crocodiles use their strong legs, feet, and tails to dig holes in muddy marshlands. The holes fill with water. Other wildlife living nearby will also make use of these water holes. An American crocodile can grow to be about 20 feet, 6 meters, long. The hatchlings have needle-sharp teeth and can hunt and feed on small fish and insects right away. An American alligator can grow to be about 12 feet, 3.6 meters, long. American alligator hatchlings have yellow stripes on their bodies, which fade away as they grow older. American alligators and American crocodiles were hunted for hundreds of years for their meat and skins. Today it is illegal to hunt them, but humans are still their main enemy. People have developed areas where these large reptiles once lived. There are fewer and fewer places where alligators and crocodiles can live in their natural environment. Stop and check. Ask and answer questions. Why are alligators and crocodiles endangered? Reread page 539 to find the answer. Wildlife preserves have been created to protect them. Alligators and crocodiles have been around for millions of years. Now they are endangered. The lives of these fascinating creatures should be respected. Endangered means threatened with extinction. All right, that takes us to the end of our first reading. I know that was a long one. Uh, we're going to jump into our second reading about butterflies. So this is also an expository text. So you're going to find the same kinds of things with uh, facts and information, pictures, diagrams, and captions. Genre, expository. Butterflies, big and small. Monarch butterflies like to land in the same trees when they migrate. Essential question. How can learning about animals help you respect them? Read how respecting butterflies can help them survive. There are more than 725 species or kinds of butterflies fluttering around the United States and Canada. These fascinating creatures taste leaves with their feet and only see the colors red, yellow, and green. The monarch butterfly and the western pygmy blue butterfly share these same traits, but they are also different in many ways. Size and color. The western pygmy blue butterfly is the smallest butterfly in the world. It is just about a half inch across, from wingtip to wingtip. That's smaller than a dime. Monarch butterflies are much bigger. They measure about four inches across. Size is not the only way monarchs are different from pygmy blues. Monarch butterflies are a bright orange color with black markings. That makes them easy to see. Pygmy blue butterflies are mostly brown and blue, and they blend in with their surroundings. Many people walk right by pygmy blues, unaware that they are even there. Western Pygmy Blue Butterfly This diagram shows the parts of a butterfly. Wing Antennae Head Thorax Leg Abdomen Moving Around Almost all butterflies migrate or move to different areas. 
The monarch's journey is the longest migration of any butterfly in the world. It spends summers in the northern United States and Canada. Then it migrates south to Mexico in early fall. Many monarchs travel more than 3,000 miles. Western pygmy blue butterflies inhabit southwestern deserts and marshes from California to Texas. They migrate short distances north to Oregon and also to Arkansas and Nebraska. Both monarchs and blue pygmies migrate when the weather gets chilly. Butterflies are cold-blooded insects. They are hot when the weather is hot and cold when the weather is cold. As a result, both butterflies migrate to stay warm. They also journey north or south to find food. Finding Food The western pygmy blue drinks the nectar of many kinds of flowers. It finds the sweet, thick liquid easily, so its population has steadily grown. However, monarch butterflies are not so lucky. Butterfly Migration this western pygmy blue butterfly stops to eat. Canada, Great Lakes, United States, Mexico, Pacific Ocean, Map Key, Orange Arrow, Monarch Butterfly Migration Route, Blue Arrow, Western Pygmy Blue Butterfly Migration Route. Just like the pygmy blue, Monarch butterflies sip nectar from flowers. But the monarch butterfly has one main food requirement, the milkweed. Monarch butterflies must find this plant along their migration route. But what happens if there are no milkweed leaves? When people build houses and roads, there are fewer places for monarchs to find milkweed. If the monarch cannot find food, its population will decrease. The western pygmy blue and monarch butterflies are not endangered or at risk for becoming extinct now, but biologists are worried. Many other butterflies are endangered because people destroy their habitats. Help Butterflies Like all wildlife, monarch and pygmy blue butterflies should be respected. People need to preserve butterfly habitats. To help, they can work to change laws, plant milkweed, and make it illegal to destroy animal habitats. Learning about butterflies and what they need to survive is important. That way there will be plenty of western pygmy blue and monarch butterflies for future generations to enjoy. Monarch butterflies feed on milkweed. Make Connections how can people learn to respect butterflies? Talk about some butterflies you've seen. How are they alike and different? Reread. Stop and think about the text as you read. Are there new facts and ideas? Do they make sense? Reread to make sure you understand. Find text evidence. Do you understand some ways the monarch butterfly is different from the western pygmy blue butterfly? Reread Size and Color on page 449. Size and Color. The western pygmy blue butterfly is the smallest butterfly in the world. It is just about a half inch across from wingtip to wingtip. That's smaller than a dime. Monarch butterflies are much bigger. They measure about four inches across. Size is not the only way monarchs are different from pygmy blues. Monarch butterflies are a bright orange color with black markings. That makes them easy to see. Pygmy blue butterflies are mostly brown and blue, and they blend in with their surroundings. Many people walk right by pygmy blues, unaware that they are even there. I read that the western pygmy blue butterfly is smaller than a dime and is mostly brown and blue in color. The monarch butterfly is about four inches wide and is orange and black. Now I understand some of the ways these two butterflies are different. 
Compare and Contrast When authors compare, they show how two things are alike. When authors contrast, they tell how the things are different. Authors use signal words such as both, alike, same, or different to compare and contrast. Find text evidence. How are the monarch butterfly and western pygmy blue butterfly alike and different? I will reread butterflies big and small and look for signal words. 1. Monarch butterflies, colorful and big. 2. Western pygmy blue butterflies blend in with their surroundings, very small. 3. Both taste leaves with their feet. Expository Text Butterflies Big and Small is an expository text. Expository text may give information about a science topic, has headings that tell what a section is about, Includes text features such as diagrams and maps. Find text evidence. I can tell that Butterflies Big and Small is expository text. It gives facts about monarch and western pygmy blue butterflies. This science article also has headings, a diagram, and a map. Text features. Headings. Headings tell what a section of text is mostly about. Diagram. A diagram is a simple picture with labels. Context clues. Context clues are words or phrases that help you figure out the meaning of an unfamiliar word. In many science texts, Context clues appear in the same paragraph as an unfamiliar word. Find text evidence. On page 450, I'm not sure what the word migrate means. I will look for clues in the paragraph. I read that butterflies move to different areas and travel more than 3,000 miles. I also see the word journey. I think migrate means to move or travel to different places. Almost all butterflies migrate or move to different areas. The monarch's journey is the longest migration of any butterfly in the world. It spends summers in the northern United States and Canada, then it migrates south to Mexico in early fall. Many monarchs travel more than 3,000 miles. All right, that takes us to the end of our notes for this week. If you guys have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing day. Take care. Bye-bye.